Hey guys, welcome to Give Your Grades a Glow Up. Today we are looking at my favorite power and conflict poem. I absolutely love it. I know you're gonna love it too. We are looking at Checking Out Me History by John Agard. Right, it's really important for you to understand the backstory so you fully understand what this poem is about. John Agard, the poet, was a little boy sitting in the classroom in Guyana and he opened up a textbook and it said West Indian history began when Columbus, a white man, discovered it. So he was like, hold on, were there not people living here before white people arrived? Why does white history dominate the curriculum? Why do we only learn about white stories in school? So in this poem, he talks about how he's being taught about British historical events, but he hasn't been informed about similar figures who accomplished similar things in other countries. So the poem's about the British education system and particularly that system's erasure of important figures from African and Caribbean history. And at the end of the poem, the speaker decides that, do you know what? I don't need you guys to teach me about my history. I'm going to take control of my own education and I'm going to seek to understand my own identity. Let's read it. A little disclaimer. The poem is supposed to be read in a West Indian Patois dialect, which I cannot do. Any accent I do just eventually becomes Indian. So bear with me. <clears throat> Them tell me, them tell me what them want to tell me. Bandage up me eye with me own history. Blind me to my own identity. Them tell me about 1066 and all that. Them tell me about Dick Whittington and he capped. But Toussaint Louverture, no, them never tell me about that. Toussaint, a slave with vision, lick back Napoleon battalion and first black republic born. Toussaint, the thorn to the French. Toussaint, the beacon of the Haitian revolution. Them tell me about the man who discovered the balloon and the cow who jumped over the moon. Them tell me about the dish ran away with the spoon, but them never tell me about Nanny the Maroon. Nanny, seafar woman of mountain dream, firewoman struggle, hopeful stream to freedom river. Then tell me about Lord Nelson and Waterloo, but then never tell me about Shaka, the great Zulu. Then tell me about Columbus and 1492, but what happened to the Caribs and the Arawaks too? Then tell me about Florence Nightingale and she lamp, and how Robin Hood used to camp. Then tell me about old King Cole was a merry old soul. But then never tell me about Mary Seacole. From Jamaica, she traveled far to the Crimean War. She volunteered to go. And even when the British said no, she still braved the Russian snow. A healing star among the wounded, a yellow sunrise to the dying. Then tell me, then tell me what them want to tell me. But now, I checking out me own history. I carving out me identity. Right, we're going to go through the poem and we are going to see if we can select at least three juicy quotations. And by juicy quotations, I mean a quote that has interesting language devices, words that we can zoom into, maybe some structural stuff as well that we can chuck in there. So we have lots of analysis because your marks lie in your analysis with lots of interpretations. And if this poem comes up in your exam, you feel equipped, like you have stuff to say. Let's start from the beginning. Right, the very first thing to notice is in the first line, then tell me. We can mind map that. Let's draw a little mind map, turn your page sideways, write them tell me, them tell me. Do you see the spelling of them? Is that how we spell them? No. So why has he spelt it like that, them? He has written it so it mimics his dialect. So it is spelt the way that it sounds. We call that written phonetically. Why has Agar done that? Why has he written phonetically? Well, he's showing that he doesn't want to hide his heritage. He's not ashamed of where he's from and what he sounds like. He is proud of his identity and his culture. 
Also, maybe I could say as an alternative interpretation that by spelling words the way he likes, he is refusing to conform to British rules and society's expectations of him. Then I can identify repetition as a language device in there. Dem tell me, dem tell me. And I'm going to say that repetition conveys his anger, the speaker's anger and frustration at the British. Dem tell me, dem tell me. It's almost as if he wants to ensure that he is heard this time and he is not ignored. Let me see if I can think of something else. Dem tell me, dem tell me. Perhaps I could also argue that the repetition conveys a sense of monotony. It's like the repetitive nature of what he's being taught. It emphasizes the boredom that he feels when he's taught the same history over and over again. I could zoom into the word tell, then tell me. That verb conveys that he's being forced to learn this information and this knowledge. He's passive. They are active. He doesn't have any control or influence in what he's being told. And then I'm going to zoom into the word me. It's a personal pronoun, me. Me. It's like he's tired of being invisible. And there's juxtaposition here between them and me. Let's take it really grade nine now. Them and me. If I call someone them, am I a part of them? Do I feel like I belong with them? No, so that juxtaposition shows there's a clear separation between black people and white people. He doesn't feel like he is a part of them. Okay, them is plural. Me is singular. There are lots of them and there is only one of him. That makes him seem like a victim, like he's being outnumbered. There's a clear disparity in the power. Love that quote, let's move on. The next bit says, bandage up me eye with me own history, blind me to my own identity. We could actually mind map this as well. You could write this down and analyze it. Bandage and blind are being used as verbs here. He is, they are bandaging him, they are blinding him. If we zoom into bandage, the verb bandage, you put a bandage on a wound when you've hurt yourself. So it's like he is physically hurt by the way his people are being treated. Also, that metaphor conveys that he's forced to cover up his true identity. Like a bandage would cover up a wound, he is being forced to cover up who he is as if he should be ashamed of it. Blind, that, that hyperbolic metaphor of saying they are blinding him, blind, being blind is a disability. They are physically oppressing him. He isn't allowed to see the truth. His history is deliberately being hidden from him. It creates this accusatory tone. Tone is a good word to use in your essays. When we think about blind, bandage, that alliteration of the letter B, if you go back to my first video where I was going through language devices with you, the alliteration of B, B, blind, bandage that's called bilabial plosive alliteration and it creates this aggressive tone which shows the violent lengths they will go to in order to sustain their control and their power so it has colonial undertones he goes on and he says them tell me about 1066 and all that them tell me about dick whittington and he cat when he says all that they tell me about all that it has this dismissive tone like he doesn't care about or value the history he's being taught and then he says and he cat so he's saying the fact that they would choose irrelevant and trivial fairy tales and nursery rhymes over significant black historical figures shows the injustice of the priorities in the education system they would rather teach you about the man's cat than teach you about really important black figures and at that point he introduces the first black figure, Toussaint Louverture. He was the first black leader of the Haitian revolution against French colonial rule. He abolished slavery in Haiti and turned it into an independent republic. If you look at this stanza, don't even read it. 
just look at it on the page. You can see something really interesting is happening structurally here. When Agar talks about important black figures, he sets it out differently on the page. The lines are shorter, the stanzas are longer, and the font is italicized. It looks different. I want you to have a think about what we can say about that. Why have those things been done structurally? Now, in the next bit, in the next stanza, there's more of a mocking and humorous tone. He says, then tell me about the man who discovered the balloon and the cow that jumped over the moon, the dish that ran away with the spoon. And then Agard employs another juxtaposition because after saying that, talking about the spoon, he goes on and he introduces Nanny the Maroon, another figure. He says, but then never tell me about Nanny the Maroon. Maroon is a general term used to describe black slaves who escaped from slavery. So Nanny the Maroon led the Maroons to victory in Jamaica against British rule. Now the fact that she is being pitted against a spoon exemplifies how absurd Agard finds her omission from the curriculum. The fact that she's been deleted from the curriculum, they don't want to teach you about her. When Agard is describing Nanny de Maroon, he uses a semantic field of nature. That means there are lots of words associated with nature. Mountain dream, fire woman struggle, hopeful stream, freedom river. Let's analyze this bit. Nature has connotations of being pure and eternal. So by comparing Nanny de Maroon to nature, Agard is demonstrating the constant resilience of black people. Mountains are powerful and strong. Fire is unstoppable. There's personification of the stream being hopeful and leading to a river. And it shows her force and her impact leading to the liberation of black people. Now, this is where I want you to bring in structure. So I want you to analyze this quotation, write about it in a paragraph, and then bring in those structure things that we were talking about. Longer stanzas. The fact that longer stanzas are being used emphasizes Agard's passion when he's talking about black history. He can't stop talking about it. And also it shows there is so much more to say. It shows how much she has contributed. And then there are shorter lines. And that perhaps symbolizes how black history has been cut short. The significance that was denied in the education system. And if we look at the font, we look at the italic font. The fact that it looks differently on the page, maybe that could show how black people are being treated differently. Remember, these interpretations are my own. You're allowed to come up with your own as well. The rest of the poem follows the same structure. It shows the unfair emphasis on white history. And he goes on and he questions. He says, what happened to the Caribs and the Arawaks too? He's asking for accountability. The Caribs and the Arawaks were the original inhabitants of the West Indies. They were the people who originally lived there at the time when Columbus discovered the islands and they were killed off by the war or sometimes because they were exposed to European diseases that they had no immunity to. Agard goes on and he makes comparisons between Florence Nightingale, and you may have heard about her in history. She was a British nurse who was famous for her work in the Crimean War. And he compares her to a Jamaican woman, Mary Seacole, who looked after soldiers in the same way that Florence Nightingale did, in the same war. And he describes Mary Seacole as a healing star among the wounded, a yellow sunrise. You could definitely analyze that. If we spot a color, color imagery, we analyze it, we talk about it. Yellow has connotations of happiness. So it's the hope that she brought for the dying. Sunrise connotes a new day. She has spiritual significance. And it's really interesting, actually. I think this is a really grade nine point. It's really perceptive. It's really interesting that light imagery is used here to describe Florence Nightingale's lamp, and that's artificial light, a lamp, it's artificial, versus natural light imagery of the sunrise of Mary Seacole. 
and it shows how Florence Nightingale was glorified. She was, there was a intentional emphasis put on her. The poem then ends with the same line. It ends with them tell me, them tell me. And you know, we spotted that at the beginning of the poem. We call that a cyclical structure when the beginning of the poem is similar to or the same as the end of the poem. We should probably think about why a cyclical structure has been used. Perhaps it symbolizes an ongoing pattern that will keep repeating itself. And the speaker feels like he's trapped in this oppression. However, this time, Agard goes on to say, but now I checking out my own history, I carving out my identity. There is a change in tone because of that conjunction, but. He's like, them tell me, them tell me, but. He's taking a stand. He's creating a change for himself. I love that metaphor of carving. He's carving out his identity. He's not literally carving it, it's a metaphor. He's saying it's gonna be difficult. It's not easy to carve. It's going to be difficult, but he's going to put in the effort to start this journey of self-discovery. He's going to reshape the narrative. And also, if you carve something, it's very difficult to get rid of it. So he's saying, once I've done this, you are not going to be able to remove it. Don't you love it? Done. Context and poet's message. Now remember, in your essay, it is not enough to just analyze language and structure. We also need to bring in context in our paragraphs. And that's basically, you need to explain what was happening at the time the poem was written, and therefore, what message was the poet trying to give to the reader? Some interesting context points for checking out my history are, John Agard, I love him. He is so great. You should watch him read the poem live. Like he's, he's so brilliant. John Agard was born in 1949 to parents of mixed nationality. In school, he was told that Guyanese history began in 1492 when Columbus discovered Guyana. And at the time he didn't question it because you don't. When you're a child and you're in school and you're learning something, you just accept what you're being taught. But as an adult, he questioned the education he received. He published this poem in a collection called Half Cast and Other Poems. Half Cast is actually the poem that I had to analyse when I was doing my GCSEs many years ago. And it's brilliant. If you haven't read it, you should go and look it up. Half Cast by John Agard and maybe like treat it as an unseen poem, write an essay on it. The collection focused on both culture and racial identity. And Agard published the collection after living in Britain for around 30 years. The poems were intended to be universal, to apply to all people living under oppression and being denied their cultural identity. And there you have it, a full analysis of another anthology poem. If you found this video helpful, please do give it a like and do not forget to check out the other videos in this series because we go in and analyze these poems in great detail.